Hello, uh, welcome to the MMU Philosophy Society podcast. We're here with uh, Dr. Dominic Kelly, and he's going to be talking about his new book on Heidegger, Bodlin, and Nietzsche. Uh, so could you introduce yourself, Dom, and um, give a little introduction to the book? Okay, yeah. Um, um, I studied at Manchester Metropolitan University. I started studying there about 20 years ago. Uh, and I started teaching there about 15 years ago. Um, and I did my my PhD with Uli, I studied my PhD with Uli, uh, on Heidegger ostensibly, uh, and I've, I pretty much, I, I teach full time now, and this, this book that I'm bringing out is kind of part, part what motivated my PhD when I originally did it, and part of it's kind of new thinking since then, or new thinking to me anyway, so um, it's more or less about, um, it's still about, it's about Heidegger and how Heidegger um, looks towards the tradition of the, of the of philosophy, a two and a half thousand year tradition of philosophy, tries to understand it and tries to understand the situation of the modern human being in terms of it. How we got here, um, why we got here and how we can possibly do something to get ourselves out of this situation. What is the situation that you're talking about? Well, I mean, it's nihilism. It's, we live in a nihilistic age. How do you define nihilism? There are lots of different ways to do it. Nietzsche, Nietzsche thinks of it in terms of the uh, our, the original values that, that the Greeks had, that get, the Greeks gave rise to. They get Christianized, and like the search for absolute truth, for example, it gets Christianized and so on, becomes moral. Uh, and it guides how we look at the world all the way up, you know, for two and a half thousand years until certainly in Nietzsche's terms, um, this idea of looking for this, this idea of absolute truth is shown to be, uh, the truth is shown to be purely historical and that this original motivation is something that arises in history because it's beneficial to the human being. Whereas in our situation now where you have, for, for example, the sciences who think they give us objective truths, they see it as, um, they, will, they, will make, they will split the atom, they will make nuclear bombs, they will, scientists will do all these things without any consideration as to what the effect of what they're doing has on, um, uh, or, or in some instances, certainly what the effect of what they're doing has on um, the human race. And of course, it becomes very technology, uh, technologized. So we have a very technologized um, world that we live in now, as you, as you know yourself, so that we no longer see ourselves as belonging so much to social groups, as belonging to uh, communities and so forth, and becoming more and more isolated which, you know, we're on the internet here today doing the exact opposite. It was, so it's not all bad, obviously, but um, for Heidegger, the idea of, uh, of nihilism is that we've lost the relation to being. What do we mean by that? Well, um, if you go back to Aristotle, for example, how does Aristotle interpret being? We have things come into being. Where do they come from? There's some, in some sense, they come from out of being. Um, now, what Aristotle does is he's, he divides the, this question up into two, so to speak. And on the one hand, he says, well, we can talk about beings and the being of beings, insofar as they have, for example, fundamentally, what's fundamental to beings is they have substance, and, they have, and there are other things we can predicate about them, you know, that they have number and form and so forth. But the actual question of being itself, the big question, uh, is just an impossible question to approach for Aristotle. Uh, so what happens is that big question of being disappears over time, because as the Greeks get reinterpreted and reinterpreted and reinterpreted, and for Heidegger, where we end up is where we are today, which is his main criticism of Nietzsche, I guess, is that um, he says that Nietzsche sees the end of this sort of history of what he calls the history of metaphysics, where the question of being about where we come from and, the, and sort of the mystery that lies at the heart of existence has completely disappeared in so far as Nietzsche determines being in the sense of their being, in the sense of um, the will to power. That's what beings are, they're the will to power and nothing more. So what you end up with is kind of a, a, a in Nietzsche, for Heidegger this is, uh, is a metaphysics of presence, where things are just present. That's it. You, if, you, if you put together the idea of the will to power and the eternal recurrence of the same, that all there is is this, you know, there's just presence, in a sense, um, for, for Heidegger. Um, so that's that's what he thinks. That's where he thinks we are. We've lost our relation to being, to the mystery that lies at the heart of our existence. Uh, we no longer question into you know when we talk about what things are. We just take them purely in terms of atemporal objects. 
uh, and, and that we rationalize about them. We think that rationality is ahistorical and atemporal. We think that objects are uh, ahistorical and atemporal. So we just kind of have, you know, science, is, science gives, us, gives us our truth these days. It's, it's, it, we think about things as purely objective, purely objective knowledge. And Heidegger you know, says this actually completely misses the idea that things are temporal. Things come into being and go out of being, including human beings. And rationality is as part of how human beings come in and go out of existence. So, for example, the way the ancient Greeks thought about logic changed 100, 150 years ago. How does logic change? It shouldn't change, should it? It's supposed to be logical. It's supposed to apply. It's supposed to transcend life and give us um, give us certain um, truths about the world that, that that obtain for all time. But it changed the way that the approach of modern logicians changed from the from the approach of ancient logicians because logic belongs, as reason belongs, to to the uh, to history and the evolution of human being as a historical being. So the history that's evolving is like is design. Which is like a, a network of meanings kind of thing or like like heidegger like the, the change that heidegger brings about is he like he gets rid of like the subject object relations doesn't he so that he so like he all he's left with design which is just like a kind of being there like existence well uh, uh Dasein's, Dasein is complicated um because on the one hand you've got your own individual Dasein. And on the, you, want, you want me to explain Dasein now? And you've got you've got a historical Dasein. We all belong to a historical Dasein. It's just simply, I mean, the German word Dasein is, in its everyday use means existence. But if you split it up into its, its concomitant parts, it means being there or being the there. The fact um, that there is a there, you know, that beings come into being and human beings come into being, uh, in some sense resides with Dasein, with the human being. Not thought of a subject, not thought of as an object or anything, you know, permanent and fixed in that sense. Dasein is what allows there, is what allows there for, for beings to come into being. It allows for beings to show themselves. But Dasein isn't stood there like an object, like a subject that just looks at the world and allows things to come into being. Dasein itself comes into being uh, in, the, in, the, in the way that it allows other beings to come into being. So to put that in, uh, in other terms, say, say you walk into a room. Now st you're looking for a chair. The whole of the room will disappear. What will stand out as meaningful for you in that room when you walk into that room is that chair. And that chair will stand out as meaningful for you because it's something you need for some particular reason that has a meaning that, that lies beyond you just walking into that room. Because you might need the chair, say, to stand on to, to, to put a light bulb in, for example. So the meaning of you going into that room is to do with what? Um, is to do with you projecting yourself onto a future task, for example. This is how he talks about it in, 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 in Being in Time. So you may have the task of uh, putting the light on because you want to read a book, because you want to finish your essay, because you want to complete your degree. As a human being, you're constantly projecting yourself onto the future. So you're open in your being. You're not just a fixed thing. And then other objects, in this case the chair, stands out meaningfully for you, not as something you sit on in that instance, but as something you stand on. So that is what a human being is essentially, certainly in, be in terms of being in time. It allows beings to come into, to be meaningful, to stand forth in meaningful dif and in different ways constantly. And it's able, and a Dasein is able to do this because the da Dasein is constantly projecting its own being into the future, from out of the past, within the present. So it's not a fixed thing. It's a it's a temporal being that has that has a meaningful so, sort of uh, aims that it projects itself on. That's as an individual being. Um, in terms of an historical being, you are you are, find yourself born at a particular time in history in a particular community, and um, and this means that you're in a sense um, conditioned by those by where you find yourself. Uh, in relation to other beings that share that history and share that community, if you want to think of it in terms of a historical or a communal Dasein. So, you know, I can't be a French musketeer, for example. That's not a possibility for me because I'm born in a different place in a different time. But it is possible for me to be a, a Manchester City supporter or something like that. So um, you have your own particular Dasein out of which you create your existence, but you also have an historical Dasein which are kind of the, what you call a sort of the factical limitations within which you are open, you are open yourself up to being. Do you have Dasein or are you Dasein? You are Dasein. Yeah. So, like, what, what came first, 
star sign or like for instance the sun or a hammer like is it is it that there was a pre-existing world into which star sign came or is it star sign itself that is the precondition for the existence of the world okay it does it isn't can i just just give me one second It isn't so much that, that things don't exist before a human being comes into existence. Um, obviously, things do exist before the human being comes into existence. But they don't stand out meaningfully in their being until the human being comes about, until the human being comes into existence. So it's, there's, there's no sense of talking about uh, a chair being near, near a wall, for example, until you have Dasein. Now, you can have a wall, you wouldn't have a chair, but let's just say for some chairs grew in the forest. You could have a wall and you could have a chair. They could be right next to each other, but it wouldn't make any sense to talk of them as being in proximity until the human being comes along. The human being is able to say that the chair is near the wall because the human being opens up beings in, in a sense, gives beings a world in which they can step forth meaningfully in, in one sense or another. So without the world, there's no proximity there between the wall and the chair. There are just two objects. But then when the when Dasein appears, Dasein comes into it, then you have a world, which is not a thing or a container or any, anything like that. A world is basically a, a series of meaningful connections that, that Dasein opens up um, through its possibilities, um, through which, it, as I said before, through which it's able to project itself onto things, to project itself into the future. From out of the past, as I say, it's possible to be, um, it's possible to go to university now to study to be a doctor, um, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, that, that wouldn't be a possibility for, for most of us, for example. It certainly wouldn't have been a possibility for me. I'd have been up a chimney or something. So, um, you know, you step forth as a human being into these uh, possible ways of being that opens everything up, that means that everything stands out as meaningful. So without the human being, yeah, there are things, but there's no sense in which you could talk about the world, you know, or truth, you know, or things like that. They only, in a sense, come about because of because of Dasein, because Dasein is that which opens up the possibility for these things to be meaningful in any sense. So Dasein, you could like do a metaphor of like a TV set where like the being itself is just like the raw data, and Dasein is what turns it into the image on the screen, like gives it a, gives it a kind of meaning. A bit more fundamental than appearance is why I don't. I'm hesitating to answer. Mm. Uh, I'm hesitating to answer that. It's not quite that straightforward. I wouldn't say. I would say. I would say. Um, I would say. I mean, and raw data as well is problematical. I would just say that um, there are beings without Dasein, but it doesn't make any sense to talk of them meaningfully in terms of their beings until Dasein comes along, because then they stand, they step forth as a tree, they step forth as a bear, they step forth as a cop, they step forth as meaningful, only because of, because of, um, because of Dasein, because Dasein, as I say, Dasein is a temporal being, so that means the Dasein isn't tied into the present, like a cow in a field, it doesn't just respond to, uh, to stimuli. It it, uh, it it opens up the possibility of things having been in the first place. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't know whether I'd, I'd, I would be quite that happy to talk about it in terms of raw data. Yeah. yeah. There are beings, but it doesn't, mean, it doesn't make sense to talk of them in those terms at all. Mm -hmm. So the human being comes along and, I'll, and, and allows, allows, opens up a space for them. So Heidegger talks about it in terms of opening up, you know, a, a space within being for them to, to, to come forth after being in time to ask me about that. That's what the human being basically does. It allows its, it allows a space within which beings can step forth meaningfully, including mm. the human being itself. The human being isn't just a given thing ever. The human being is constantly moving towards the future from out of its past, which in some sense you know limits it uh, within the present. So the, it's constantly moving like that. The human being. So it's never a fixed thing. It's constantly finding meaning in the world and it's bringing other things out into this sort of space in which they can be meaningful in relation to the human being. But of course, the human being doesn't just stand in relation to other beings. It stands in relation to being itself, which is the problem for Heidegger. 
we are within being. And what happens in in in, uh, in modernity, what we, what Heidegger refers to as nihilism, is that this space that we open up within being, it kind of disappears, and all we're left with is the subject and the object. So instead of things coming into and going out of being, and instead of the human being and things themselves being dependent upon being as such, that which allows things to be, a big thing, difficult thing to think, more difficult to talk, uh, to talk about, but. Um, The, these things are these things are not um, cannot be thought of as purely um, a subject and an object. You have to think about them as coming into and out of being, and that means you have to have some relation to being itself. And that is what we've lost in modernity. We have no sort of inkling about the the sort of the um, sort of mystery that lies at the heart of being itself. The fact that things just come into being and go out of being that's kind of gone. We just see things as purely being present. Mm -hmm. So I want back, back to, to just to refer back to the example I gave before, the science is an object is purely uh, atemporal, ahistorical, it just stands out in itself from all connections to anything whatsoever. And the human human rationality does the same. So you can you can mathematize you can mathematize um, the universe if you wish. It pays no attention to the fact that things come into an out of being whatsoever. Heidegger thinks this is the problem that lies at heart of modern day. Um, uh, at the, mod of the modern day, certainly the Western world, Western thinking, Western understanding of itself, which is, of course, dangerous. Because then what do you end up with? You end up with human resources. You end up with human beings. I mean, you, there are lots of problems. I don't need to, to go, go through them all, but you end up with human resources, for example, where a human being is reviewed is viewed as purely as a resource. That's what a human being is. It's a resource that you can move about, you can employ, you can have on a temporary contract and bring and let go when you want. Uh, and of course it has an effect on everything else, on the rest of the species in the world and on the world itself and the possibility that we turn the world into a cinder because we don't think of anything other than in terms of them being present and being present for us to be able to utilise them. Yeah. Just see, sorry. sorry um, correct me if I'm wrong, like, but is Darcy not similar to context or is Darcy not context really? Like things are given meaning because of context like are they not like one and the same or yeah yeah in a sense it's con in a sense it gives things their context yeah yeah because certainly in being a time if you want to believe it just leave it in those terms uh, Darzine allow uh, allows for allows for connections between things contexts out of which things are able to stand so yeah it's certainly in that sense but you've got to remember that Darzine itself belongs within that context Darzine, Darzine belongs um, within being itself it comes into being from out of being, so you have to account in some sense for being itself. Um, but yeah, you can you can say that Dasein, in the sense, gives Dasein is in, in being a time of web of it's kind of a web of significance, a web of meaning to things that allows them to have to stand out, as you say, in a context there, in a meaningful context, because because of Dasein's involved in some project or another. So this, the scientific understanding sees the world as like a, a dead world of kind of inanimate, like fixed objects and uh, that, that are just permanently present and, and never come into or out of being. Well, the knowledge it gets, yeah, that it thinks of knowledge in that, in those, in that yeah. sense. And so Heidegger is trying to like, he's almost, a, he's a little bit mystical in a sense and he's trying to kind of like bring us back into a confrontation with like the mystery of being and, and that's what, it, what his turn is and uh, it is not like in the focusing on poetry. Yeah, um, this isn't. This isn't. This is kind of a criticism of, or an accusation that's levelled at Heidegger and that something mystical about him, about what he's doing. Um, I don't see that as a problem. Um, I really don't. And, and there is a sense in which um, he's trying to introduce the fact that at the heart of being, at the heart of existence, there is something mysterious. Um, now, the way he tries to reintroduce that, which is something else I deal with, um, is in his engagement. I mean, his, 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 um, his adumbrating, his outlining of what metaphysics, of what nihilism is, comes out of his engagement with Nietzsche very much in the 1930s and in the 1940s. And he comes back to Nietzsche a lot. He comes back in the 1950s as well. But he also, in the 1930s and 40s, engages with the, with the German poet Friedrich Hölderlin. And what he sees in Hölderlin is at least bringing the idea 
um, that there is some kind of mystery at the heart of existence, back into focus somehow. Because Herdelin's poetry, and again, it, it's significant what he does there. He's not looking at, a, he's not, I mean, obviously Nietzsche's not a straightforward philosopher either. Uh, he's very fragmentary in, in, his, in his thinking. But, um, but Herdelin's a poet, and he turns to poetic language, the poetic language of specifically of Herdelin, because of what poetic language allows for. So poetic language allows for this idea of mystery to come forth somehow. The world is defamiliarized in the poem. Um, but the significance of Herdelin is that Herdelin's poetry deals with, tries to understand the world in terms of the, of, uh, the, the ancient gods have fled. Um, the ancient gods have fled, they are no longer here with us. So what does this mean for us? What does this mean for our existence? Um, Heidegger thinks it's a time for, it's a time for decision. Hildelin opens up the possibility for us to understand our world, both as, as mysterious as the time when the gods have fled, fled and at a time for decision as to what, what do we do. That's our whole history gone. That's the world, the gods have fled. Whereas, what does Nietzsche do? Nietzsche tries to recuperate uh, a sense of the Dionysian from the ancient Greeks. He tries to sort of reintroduce that in some sense. But Hildelin doesn't, which is why uh, Heidegger says that that, um, that Nietzsche belongs still to that history of metaphysics. What Hölderlin offers the opportunity, affords us the opportunity of finding a way out of this history by saying, "Look, the ancient gods are dead. We no longer, we no longer uh, live in that world. In a sense, they fled. What do we do now? I mean, it's a desolate, it's a desolate thing as well. Um, it's, 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 it certainly is." Um, because what, what it means by the gods of fled, where does the meaning of our existence lie? Where does it reside? That's one thing that a god does. A god gives you a, um, a, a communal meaning that gives, that gives you a sense of identity and gives your life a, a direction in which to go. When you take the gods away, when you, when you, take, when you take away that kind of divine, um, transcendent idea of something towards which you can point your existence, then what are you left with? Uh, you're left with, the, with positivism, in a sense. You're just left with what is given, you know, matters governed by laws of nature and spinning infinity, which, of course, Nietzsche deals with. But um, there's a sense in trying to give us a direction back there in, in the Heidegger's thinking also. And so does Hodelin offer a new direction, or does he just open the possibility of... Uh... He, he offers, he offers well, for Heidegger, he offers the moment for decision. We can make a decision about where we are, you know. Um, that's what he offers up. Not only a decision about where we are with regards to the gods having fled, where, in a sense, meaning having fled, uh, at least a communal sense of meaning, a meaning outside of the purely, the purely positively given universe. But um, um, it's a time of what do we want to do? Do we, you know, we are here. What do we, what do we want to do with that? Do we want to try and create a new history in some sense? Does Herbelin give us this new history? Heidegger thinks he does. But it's also a decision about language. Uh, and it's a de decision about whether poetry is something that can... Because Heidegger thinks that uh, art in its very... Uh, in its es well, I think we'll talk about essence. Art in its very nature, at least, um, affords us the possibility of truth. Affords us the possibility of opening up history, of opening, opening up a world. Uh, and he thinks that poetry is the most fundamental form that art takes. And uh, so he also wishes to see, or he also wonders whether if uh, Herdelin's poetry does actually open up this new history in the, by, the, by t taking away, by undermining the previous history and saying, look, gods have gone. What do we do? Where do we go? How do we find some meaning here? So the decision about whether art uh, allows us to, uh, uh, to open up a new history or not. So he's seeing this as a possibility here of moving away from the metaphysical history of the West to a new history that's other than metaphysical, that is, does that reside in the possibility of R, as well as does it reside specifically in the possibility of Hölderlin as the, as the, as the, uh, the poet that, in a sense, um, sounds the death knell for the history of, of, of uh, Western thought since the ancient Greeks. So you said that Heidegger thinks that Hölderlin um, not only opens up the possibility for this new history, but that he, he provides some kind of suggestion of what the new history could be based on. No, 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 he doesn't really, no, but he opens up the possibility for us to say, well, the gods have fled, where do we point, where do we point, where do we go, where do we go from here, 
do we step out of this history? Do we leave this history behind? Uh, in a very real sense, uh, I mean, it's in Nietzsche too, in a very real sense, once you realize that the gods have fled, then that undermines that history. Mm. So the history of the West that's led to where we are today that leads to nihilism, that history um, comes to an end because it's undermined. But what Nietzsche is, because you can recognize it for what it is, you can actually, you can, can actually sort of, even though you still belong to it, you can see what it is. You can see it for what it actually is right at the very end. So that takes the power away from it because you understand where you come from and how you got here. Um, how the historical relation to being. Well, how our historical relation to being has completely vanished um, as, far, as far as Heidegger is concerned. Being has hidden itself from us. We no longer have that relation to being. So how do we, Heidegger's question, I guess, is how do we open up a new relation to being? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that means that we have to think historically. Um, to think historically requires us to get away from our metaphysical thing. Not an easy thing to do because that's how we think. He does try it, he does try it, which is what I'm interested in. I'm interested in, I mean, my, my basic interest is in the idea of his thinking historical, uh, historically again, getting away from metaphysics. And in a sense, Nietzsche does it. Uh, again, talking from a Heideggerian perspective. Nietzsche does think the history, does think historically when he says God is dead. That's very much a historical thought because it points to the past very much. So it also points to the future in the very you know proclamation that God is dead. Where do we go from here? But he, but for, for Heidegger, Nietzsche thinks this uh, historical thought from within the history of metaphysics, which is what leads him to think of the eternal occurrence the same um, as a way of getting beyond the problems that beset us at the, at the end of this history. But Heidegger says, no, we're actually, Nietzsche brings an end to that whole thought because the eternal occurrence is the same, it's just basically determining the whole of life in, as the relations of power that just go round and round and round. So in a sense, never move, never go anywhere. They're permanently present. Uh, and what, what Heidegger wants to do is move beyond this and think in, sort of historically in a different way. He tries to, to try and think historically. Uh, to historically think through a relation to being somehow. Um, and he does, when he does this actually, which is what, again, I find really fascinating, he does this very much at the end of the 1930s in, in um, three or four texts. And, he, and these three or four texts, if you look at them, they're very Nietzsche in, in how they speak, in, in the language, in the way that they use language, in the form. They're very fragmentary ways of thinking about things. So Heidegger is actually, in trying to escape um, from the history of metaphysics and the metaphysical thinking and trying to open up, to somehow find a way of thinking historically at the end of the history of metaphysics to, to try and open up a new way of, a new history, so to speak, or to, to think this through at least as a problem. He actually, he actually is very Nietzschean in his thinking, certainly at the end of the 30s and the 40s, very fragmentary thoughts. Um, but again, like Nietzsche's, they're linked, you know, if you read through Nietzsche's fragmentary thoughts in, in his text, they, they're, they're linked to each other, but they're broken off from each other as well. Because he doesn't want to rationalise, he wants to try and get away from that. He certainly, you know, they, they both certainly do that. Um, how effectively, again, um, that remains to be seen, and we're running out of time, you know. Um, but that, that's, that's what interests me, this idea of thinking historically rather than metaphysically. So if, if we're not basing uh, on the meaning of our lives on God, so what would Heidegger propose? Like now, if we if we wipe the slate clean of, of metaphysical thinking and 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 we're, we're we're trying to found history again, then what what are, what is Heidegger? What are his suggestions for what we what we can found it on? There isn't you, can, you know it doesn't it doesn't really work like that because. Um, there would be that's that, that would have been a sense of representational thinking there, a sense of willing involved in it. To think historically is, in a sense, to bring something up that you can't see. Because if you can see it, then it belongs to it belongs to conscious thought. And historical thought doesn't belong to conscious thought in that sense. What what it, what you would do is you would bring something to the surface that's historical, that that is new. So if you look at it in, in terms of that, you know, that's out of sight, you know, that, that you're bringing something to sight, you can think of this, you know, just to go back to Hurdling, Hurdling is talking constantly about the absence of the gods. 
So in a sense, what comes to light in his poetry um, is something that can only come to light in, in you know, in that sense, in, in a very desolate way. You know, the gods have fled. The gods have left us to ourselves, to our own devices. Uh, it comes to the fore in his poetry without him actually saying that. You know, the poet is able to bring something like that, something historically significant, which speaks to the past and the future, in the actual poetic word, not in a not in a sort of declarative sentence, but in a poetic word, which is something that you can return to again and again and again, um, because it's constantly. Um, um, it renews its meaning in a sense the more you go back to it or it changes its meaning or its significance uh, now what heidegger will say that the philosopher can do the philosopher can step in and say ah look this is what's come to what this is what's come to light in the poem here the gods have fled and and can deal with that can engage thinking with that thought but in a sense if you want to think historically this is why he turns to help you're trying to drag something up that's not in the light you're trying to drag something up from out of the dark and as he says, art is the best thing to do it. I mean, we're thinking art. You, we're thinking about it in terms of great art. Here. So he talks about Greek temples. If you look at um, a text like or in the Origin of the Work of Art, which he wrote in 1935, he's talking about a Greek temple. What does the Greek? When the Greeks build a Greek temple, it brings the god there. It brings the god to the people within the people. It's an artwork in that sense. It brings the god to the people. It changes their environs. It gives them meaning. It changes, you know, the whole. The whole landscape changes it becomes a world it becomes meaningful in a very specific sense or a very particular sense and gives meaning to the life of people that's not something you can stand here and say let's go in this direction let's go in that direction it's something that occurs through the artwork so that's what that's kind of what historical i mean it's not a great way of speaking about it. it's difficult to know how to how to explain it but it's kind of like bringing things up out of that where we are what our situation is bringing these to the, somehow bringing these to the light and then trying to to understand surely so, uh, to see where we are in some sense. yeah it's no trouble with that though that the meaning of art is ultimately subjective like you can't really say one kind of art is better than another kind so let's say i don't know i have a plate of spaghetti or something that could bring to light the flying spaghetti monster which may be our nation's god like surely surely like art itself is subjective and doesn't really have any objective meaning. We just give it meaning. Meaning doesn't come out of the art. Um, we give the art meaning. Couldn't you argue that? Yeah, lots of people do. Um, so that's, the, the, I guess, aesthetic. Mm -hmm. what, what Heidegger has in mind here is, um, is firstly great art. Uh, and we don't have great art anymore. Uh, and by great art, art, he means an art that gives, that grounds a history, that grounds a meaningful community. Mm -hmm. Now, that's nothing that we recognise. But if you want to understand how it works, then you have to understand it in terms of what Heidegger says. First of all, you have to get rid of this idea of subjectivity um, and the idea that the meaning of an art, of the artwork, is purely in the subject, um, in, in the way that the subject is affected. Or that you can even, even that you can go and talk to the artist and for them to tell you what the artwork means. For art, for Heidegger, art purely and simply happens in the artwork and can only be understood in terms of the artwork itself. So there's no going to the to the to the sub because, for example, um, the poet, the poet is a poet in the poet. Not walking down the street to go to the shops. The poet can be defined as a poet purely in what in that in that poetry. So to understand the poet as the as the as a poet, you have to look to the poet. So that this is a, a an old way of looking at of art. Art reveals the truth. It reveals the truth to an artwork. And again, I'm talking about a temple which you wouldn't think of a Greek an old Greek temple. You wouldn't think of as an, an artwork. But behind that, an artwork is something that reveals the truth to a people that grounds that the truth for that people. Like I say, in the terms of a Greek temple, it brings the god into that temple the god of that temple it, the temple changes the the sort of the landscape in which the, the, the that community lives it brings the god into the temple it means it gives them gives their lives a meaning towards which they project themselves that's what an artwork does for heidegger that's what a great work of art does for heidegger uh, and it's and so it's not this sort of aesthetic way of thinking about the artwork where we all have our subjective idea of something or where we understand an artwork in terms of what the artist thinks it is 
the artwork, great artwork, um, or any artwork for that matter, can only be understood in terms of that work of art itself. So it does, I mean, you, it, it, I say go and read The Origin of the Work of Art. It's a great piece of work to read. It's, it's an extraordinary piece of philosophy. Uh, and it's not a long book, it's a long text, it's a difficult text. What he uses, he tries to get out the idea of what a simple thing is. And um, he, he tries to do it sort of philosophically, scientifically, approaching what it is. And in the end, he, he talks about a pair of peasant shoes and he gives, he brings forth from out of a picture that he saw, a painting that he saw of Van Gogh, he brings forth the meaning of the peasant's life. He, he says, in the painting is contained the meaning of the peasant's life and he's able through a work of art rather than pure than philosophy to show how artwork reveals the truth. That's not great art, of course, because it's not going to bring a community together. However, it is a work of art still. It still reveals truth in that work itself. So the culture is founded on the profundity of its art kind of thing. The strength of the culture is the, is the profundity of the art. I don't know about, I don't know about the, 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 the strength of the culture, but it gives it its meaning. I mean, if you're talking about the strength of a culture, then you and take it you're compar comparing the culture with another culture, or are you thinking in some some way different? Well, I just mean like the, the nihilistic culture that we have now. Like he, 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 he wants to, an artwork to be produced that's so profound that it kind of revolutionizes the way that we relate to being and kind of well, it changes the way we look at things. Yeah. 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 And brings us into a into a confrontation with like a, a direct experience of being kind of thing. Well, you can't have a direct experience of being. It's always, it's always a, uh, you only ever experience being, in a sense, through beings. However, when, if you've got, just, just to use a really crass, general way of looking at it, just to go back to this temple again, so we can kind of stick to the, if you've just got sort of, um, kind of a wilderness, and then suddenly you stick a temple up, and all the people come around it, and exist there and, and the God comes there and they understand themselves in terms of this God and how they are supposed to live and so on and so forth. That that changes the whole landscape completely. They look how they used to look at things now. They'll see how they used to look at things because they look at things anew. So they've shifted. That's a new history for these people. They say they were nomads wandering around in the desert. The temple goes up. They would say they were godless nomads. They were now the temple goes up. They build a town around the temple. They worship in the temple. They they um understand themselves in terms of, of the uh, words handed down through the prophets by this God and so on and so forth, their world has completely changed. They see things differently. It's not a direct experience of being, but it is an experience of being through, you know, through other beings, through the God, for example, here. So, and, and through, the, through the temple and, and so on and so forth. So it does give definition. They do give definition to our relation to being, but it's not, a, it can never be a direct relation to that. Because it's all, always in being. Things come into being, where do they come from? They come from out of being. You can never get to that. That's the mystery. That's the mystery of being. There's always that that doesn't come into being. There's always that to which we return, where you know you can't grasp hold of it in, in any sense. There's a, there's a darkness, a, a, a nothingness attached to being that we can never grasp hold of. You can never grasp hold of it, but you can kind of spy it, you know, glance at it see hints of it like you know when, if you're looking at it which is what Heidegger tries to do so what is it about one artwork that makes it more profound than another like what is it about great art that allows it to to bring up this thing into into unhidden unhiddenness or whatever it, but it, 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 ju it just does it it's that's the nature of the artwork is to do that there is a point there is a point, you know, like you talked about, for example, world, worlds, and being, and time, and world. There is a point when you've got to stop looking for causal explanations, and you've just got to look at the, look at the thing itself as what it is. Um, and so it's in, it's in the nature of a great artwork to reveal the truth of the people to itself. And, then it, and therefore it founds a people, it founds a history, it, it founds a meaning for those people. That's in the very nature of what an artwork does. To try and rationalise it, um, is, you, you'll not end up there. You'll not end up with a, with a rational explanation. But you can see. I mean, you can paint the picture. He, paint, he he talks about the 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 Van Gogh painting. He shows you how truth happens in a work of art in that description, and he talks about great works of art in terms of temples. But you know, he has to go right the way back. You know, for what? great works of art used to do because we don't have works of art that do that anymore 
Uh, that doesn't mean, though, I mean, he's not, I mean, he criticises Hegel for this, but it doesn't mean that art can't do that. It's in the very essence of art that it's able to do that. Whereas for Hegel, you know, um, art's dead in terms of that, in terms of revealing the truth of people. For, for, West, for the West, anyway, or for European, European people, as far as Hegel's concerned. Well, I'm curious, um, could you like to put this into context, like modern day context, would like a profound piece of art, like let's say be something that critiques modern day values or something and inf like just influences like political thought in general. So something like the Kendrick Lamar album to Pimp a Butterfly, that greatly influences, like, you know, that's greatly influenced political thought and stuff like Black Lives Matter protests. Would that be an example of profound art or? Black Lives Matter protests. Like um, to Pimp a Butterfly and how it's influenced movements like Black Lives Matter. Well, I mean, it, it, again, I mean, you'd be asking me, um, does can artwork still reveal truth? Yes, it can. It certainly can reveal truth. Uh, I mean, And is it possible for, for a, as I said, for, as far as I think it's concerned, for an artwork to, to be a great work of art and open up a way, a different way of looking at things? Yes, that is still a possibility. But whether it actually does it, I mean, none of those examples that you've, you've mentioned, would, I would regard as anything like great art. They've not changed the way we look, you know, the, the world, the community that looks at the world. You know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't know about the first instance of Artworks certainly can reveal truth, and artworks, whatever it is, um, can certainly um, change the way we look at things and think about things. Yeah, absolutely. That hasn't changed. I know that. We, I mean, we know that from our own experience of reading books or looking at a painting, you know, mm -hmm. or listening to a piece of music. Even you, you, you know, an artwork can can change how you feel, how you see things, how you interpret things, or how you see things. Certainly, they can, and then you think about how they can. I certainly, I certainly think that, but I would not. I would say none of these are great works of art. I mean, what a, what a great work of art would be that would change. I mean, we live in this sort of global village thing now. What a great work of art would be um, that would change would change it. I can't imagine. I mean, Heidegger says he says um, only a god can save us. Only a god can save us now. So how that would come about, mm -hmm. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Is it, is it true that Heidegger thinks that poetry, poetry is the greatest form of art? Yeah. Fundamentally, the essence of art is poetical, which by which you mean poetical, which is to reveal, it reveals truth. Uh, and poetry is the most fundamental way of doing that. But it, it's because it's, art is poetical, it reveals truth about things. It reveals beings in their beings. So if you, like I say, to go to that, to that, to go to that example of the, um, of the Van Gogh painting in which, um, I've got a one on here, not the real, not a real one. I'm just looking up at it. But there's a, there's a peasant in the field. It's a peasant woman's shoes that he's looking at, and he, the, the actual painting reveals for him the reality, the truth of that peasant woman's life. So, re artworks can reveal the truth about things, you know, absolutely, certainly. And the reason that they are able to do that is because they are poetical. That means. They bring things out, they bring beings, they reveal beings in their being. So the, the being of that woman in her life, in how she is, in, in the toil of her everyday work and so forth. And, it, and it's a really extraordinary description Heidegger gives. So he certainly thinks, even within the history of metaphysics, that our works still reveal truth. And they reveal truth because they can reveal beings in their being, mm. which is something we lose sight of. Because a pair of shoes, if science comes towards these pair of shoes, it's not going to talk about them in terms of the dirt on them that, talk, that, that um, reveal how that woman has spent her day plowing the fields and so on and so forth. That's not a scientific explanation of what's going on there. But it's certainly more compelling, Heidegger's um, explanation of those shoes as revealing the being of that woman's life. It's far more compelling than a scientific investigation which, or a philosophical approach than a traditional philosophical approach in which he tries to give him that essay. Um, so yeah, artwork reveals truth because it's able to reveal beings in their being. And so this culture that we live in now, of nihilism, um, 
that's not based on any kind of truth. Like you wouldn't say that 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 this culture that we live in now is being revealed by like the Republic, like the 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 art, the the book, the Republic, or like that 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 our culture now is founded on some kind of work of art produced by the Greeks or something. Well, I mean, firstly, nihilism isn't you know isn't philosophy or a way the position you take on things. Nihilism is just putting the value of nothing on. So that means you don't see anything as intrinsically worthwhile. So it's always a means to an end, in a sense. But I mean, our history, our history is founded upon, um, I mean, Nietzsche tells us about this right away from, from um, the birth of tragedy. Our history is founded really on um, Greek philosophers. So, I mean, Nietzsche bemoans the fact that the Greek philosophers give the truth of, of their world to the Greek people, and in so doing, destroy sort of Greek tragedy. Because before the philosophers came along, the Greeks understood themselves and the truth of who they were in works of art, in, in the tragedies as they saw them upon the stage, in the works of Homer. You know, that's how they understood themselves. That's where they got the truth of their existence from, from from artwork and what philosophy co comes along and does in the ancient Greek times is to is to move the focus away from the artwork to um, to philosophical thinking, to rational thinking in the, in the end. Uh, and our, our whole history, I mean Heidegger talks about it in terms of once you rationalise, you make something present and then you analyse it, you examine it, what you're doing is you're making the truth of your world something that is always present. And it doesn't all happen with the Greek. It gets reinterpreted and reinterpreted. It gets you certainly get Romanized and Christianized and so on. And you get and, and obviously with Descartes in the modern world, and then with Kant and then with the positivists, it keeps getting reinterpreted and reinterpreted till you end up where we are now, where you just think that the truth is something that the sciences give us because they are capable of objective you know, knowledge. That's where you end up. But it was it's all in a sense, you know, everything's purely present. But it was all in a sense goes all the way back to the Greek to Plato, to Aristotle, and in the sense of how they determine being, beings, uh, in the sense that they're present. Now, they understood them as coming to presence, as presencing, but what also attached, attached to presencing is that which remains absent. And that's what Heidegger tries to bring out when he goes back and reinterprets the Greeks. He tries to go back and look at art, the world that they lived in, what they took for granted in their texts, the background, what's hidden in their text that shows that actually the possibilities that lay, that lay there for their thought, but that they don't get don't get um, outlined in that thought. So obviously, if they determine being in terms of beings and beings in terms of being present or presencing, then that absent bit, which they needed and they understood in order to be able to interpret beings as presencing, that gets left back, that gets left out. So that opens up a whole possibility, a, a whole new, you know, possibly a whole new. Uh, it, it shows us that it's possible to have a, the, 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 the understanding of the West since the Greeks is something that's purely historical. It's a historical determination or determination then redetermination. But it also shows that there's a possibility of something, another way, you know, other ways of determining, of having a relation to being that aren't just purely outlined by the ancient Greeks. Mm. So that, that's what Heidegger tries to do a lot, certainly in the... In, in being, if you read that, I keep going back to being in time, which isn't really my interest, but it's kind of the most important text in Heidegger because everything relates back to it in some sense. And he's doing something very specific in that text. But one of the things he's doing in that text is he's outlining, you know, what, what deep down is at, was at, is at stake in the world at the moment, or what the problem really is at stake. And he's, and he's tracing it back to the ancient Greeks and saying, this is how we got here. Um, and that's important. That's important because again, it's what Heidegger is trying to do in that text. It's not only to show um, the situation that we're in, but also to show um, that it doesn't necessarily have to be in this way. That this is a historically determined situation that we find ourselves. In. So, how would um, Heidegger respond to someone like Camus, who says that we should just kind of em embrace the meaninglessness of uh, reality, uh, like and, and and like embrace the absurd?
Well, uh, that, I mean, I guess I, I mean, I've never thought of it in those terms, but I guess Heidegger thinks that, um, I mean, they've got a lot in common, to be honest, Heidegger and Camus. I mean, if I was going to make one distinction between the two of them, it is that Heidegger sees that unless we open up a relation with being, that means unless we open up a relation in which the human being doesn't stand as, as the centre and the meaning of the world, we're never going to get out of this situation. Um, this is a, this is a problem with Sartre as well. I mean, if, if you, I mean, what's Heidegger trying to do? He's trying to he's trying to come to terms at, with the, this idea of the death of God in Nietzsche, which of course is what Camus is doing, and is what uh, is what Sartre is doing also. But what is the way he's trying to do that? Is he's trying to, in some sense, reintroduce a notion, reintroduce a notion, a, a relation to being, reintroduce the notion of a mystery at the heart of existence, um, which is what the other two aren't interested in doing. Because if you just, I mean, existentialism is a humanism, humanism is basically making the meaning of everything the human being, putting the human being at the centre of all meaning. And there's nothing more nihilistic for Heidegger than that. And what you need to have is that you don't make the human being the meaning of everything. You make the human being what the human being is, the possibility of the universe, of every, all, all that's in being, of being aware of itself. The human being, is, in a sense, has to act as a what he calls the shepherd of being. It has to look after beings and their being. It has to have a relation to being. It's not the centre of everything. You can't make the human being, well, Heidegger, resist this idea that you make the human being the centre, the meaning of everything. The human being has a responsibility to being, within being, in relation to being, which means that it has to allow beings, you know, rather than objectifying them or anything like that, it has to allow beings to come into some sense, to come into, to come to be what they are, rather than to dominate them, to infer, what he calls enframe them, you know, like uh, to allow a forest to be a forest and not to allow, and not to turn it into a, a possible, you know, a resource of timber. That's what, that's what Heidegger wants to do. When it's a resource of timber, it's just purely the human being at the centre of this uh, understanding of our world. And so I wouldn't, I would like that, you know, if I was going to distinguish between Heidegger and Camus, it would certainly be in the sense that he, he would like to, in some sense, move the human being from off its central position. Which is not to say that Heidegger, not to, 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 I mean, Camus didn't, Camus didn't write enough um, strict, strict philosophy to be able to say that he, he would disagree with that in any sense. But what, what, what Camus is concerned with is the human being making its, ex, making its life meaningful purely in its own terms, um, which means not thinking about what lies beyond existence, about God or anything else. So there is a bit of a difference in that, a little bit of a difference in that. But it's not as, I don't think it's as big as you think, um, but it's certainly a difference. But if, if Dasein is the being through which all beings come into being, isn't it by definition the centre kind of thing? It, it's that through it is, yeah. But you've got to remember that you're not an object. You're not, a, you know, this a subject which is a very special kind of object. But you're not in control of anything. You find yourself here just as much as everything else finds itself here. So because Dasein is able to bring things into meaningfully into the into 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 a space into being as in, in some way meaningful. Dasein is also coming in some way meaningfully into that space in its engagement with things. So Dasein finds itself here just like beings do. And Dasein is, is here because of being, not because it chooses to be here. So being, the Dasein finds itself here as, as this being that's allowing things to be meaningful, but at the same time, Dasein finds itself here. It's not in control, it's not the centre of things, it finds itself here in a relation with beings through its relation to being. So it it has for Heidegger a responsibility there. It's not the centre of the meaning of everything around which everything orientates itself. It has a relation to things and a, and a bigger responsibility to being. So it has to be understood in those terms and kind of delivering beings in, into the being in a responsible way, in a way that allows them to be what they are, rather than coming into being, saying, right, I'm here, 
Everything else is meaningful only towards me. And everything's going to step forward now, not as a forest over here, or not as, as, as the ocean over here, but as, you know, um, on, as timber, you know, or as a source of power to, 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 to create things. You've got to take this book behind Edgar. You have to re, re envisage the human being as, as I say, the shepherd of being, as being responsible to allow other beings to come into being. And when you say when you say that design finds itself here, like design is the here in which it finds itself, kind yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a really, it's a really difficult thought, Harry. I mean, it's a really, really difficult thought. But, um, and it's after being in time, you get more of that. You get more of the design finding itself here because you have to think of it in terms, he thinks of it in historical terms. But essentially, what is a human being? A human being, the Findlay Kite, which he talks about, the human being finds itself, finds itself through through moods and in another way through language. It finds itself in being. You don't come in here. You don't own that. You don't own being. You're not in control of being. You just find yourself sort of, you know, within it. And you also find yourself having to engage with things with other beings all the time. So you're not you're not in control. You're not the centre of all this. You just find yourself here. And, and what Heidegger is saying, he says, instead of turning, instead of reducing the meaning of everything around you to a resource for the human being, what you have to do is take responsibility and allow these things to come forward in this, in, as what they are, the beings that they are. So what's the relation between Dasein and the body? Because like, for instance, you say like, Dasein finds itself here but it seems to me like every, if everything finds itself in Dasein, but the, the body um, the body finds itself in the world kind of thing. Yeah. But, but if Dasein is, is, is the openness in which all beings appear, the body is appearing in Dasein. Isn't it? I'm just not sure what the relation is. That. Well, it's meaning. I mean, this is how I talk about it anyway. This is how it makes sense to me. Things are meaningful. Because of Dasein. Now, Dasein is incredibly limited, of course. It's historically limited. It's, it's what Heidegger says is factically limited. What's a factical limitation on Dasein? It comes with a body, and a body's finite, and that plays a really big part in who you are. Why does it play an important part in who you are? What do human beings know about themselves? And the human beings know that one day in the future, because they are bodily, they're going to be dead. And that, at least in being in time, that is what gives or allows in a, in a world where God is dead, where God is absent in Hoglin's terms, where God is dead in, in Nietzsche's terms, that allows for, for us to have a meaningful existence. That means, to, which is, it's a factical part of our existence. Our bodies mean that we will die. And that plays a part in that. It limits us. It's a factical part of our existences. And that, but it's fundamental because... The idea that we, we, we are going to die is something that isn't, it's not something that happens at the end of our lives. It is something we tend not to think about. But as Heidegger says, our relation to our death is the most fundamental relation we have. In being the time, the, the most fundamental relation, we're aware of our deaths constantly. So if, if God is dead and you want to make yourself, your life meaningful, then um, the, way, the way that you can make your life meaningful is to orient it with the idea that you're going to die one day in mind, which would mean that you would... Do, you would live perhaps a what kind of terms an authentic life rather than an inauthentic life, which is just to say that rather than living your life in the way that people live their lives, you will live in a life that, that you will live your life and you will do things that relate specifically to your own death, which will occur at some point. That will make them meaningful. So that means if you want to cash it out in very simple terms, that you would, because you know you're going to be dead one day, you might think to yourself, what do I want to do when I, when I, um, for a job, for example, when I go up, or however you want to think of it. Now, you might want to go to university and study philosophy to become a philosopher. That might be one thing that will, because, because that will make your life meaningful. I've got a short amount of time, I want to be a philosopher. That would, make your, that would be an authentic decision for you to go to university and, and, and reason why to study. However, you might live an inauthentic life, which means that you would go along with pretty much what everybody else does. You just go along generally doing that kind of thing. Which means that you might end up at university, but you're only going there because your friends are going there, uh, and there's three years to kill, and then you'll, you know, you'll see what you do after that. 
So there's an authentic possibility and an inauthentic possibility there that relates to our death. And that death, the awareness of our death, is obviously aware to our transcendence, our, our temporal being, our consciousness of that as a fact. But it's also tied to a factical limitation. The bodies that we find ourselves in only last for a certain amount of time. Mm. So, yeah, you do find yourself in a body, in being, but the meaning of that, obviously, comes from Dasein. Because Dasein is transcendent in the end, uh, and, which means it has a relation to the past and the future as well as the present. Uh, it does mean other things than that, but we have that because we have that relation, and we are, as you said, bodily, we still, the meaning is the meaning comes from Dasein not being a fixed thing. It, it comes from it being able to transcend, or as Heidegger to, to talk, to trans, to, to project itself we're aware of our deaths why because we can project ourselves into the future onto a future possibility or as heidegger says the future possibility of there being no more possibility that death is the final is that like the end of our possibility so between now and then i can make my life meaningful because as a human being i'm able to project myself into the future and how do i make my, my life meaningful I, I, my past you know it's because what how, wherever i'm born either community wise or historically and of course, physically as well, in the sense, um, in some sense, limits what I can do, what my projects can be. Well, I still make it meaningful. I'm still affording a meaningful existence wherever I find myself and however I find myself. I feel this um, about Heidegger's beliefs. Like, how do how do Heidegger's beliefs like lead into a support for the Nazi Party? Because that was like a big part of. Heidegger's life that he was um, a, an ardent supporter of Nazis. Like, how did his philosophical beliefs lead into that, or did they lead into that? Well, that's a really technical. That's a really technical question. Um, Heidegger was a Heidegger was a Nazi for like ten months. Uh, he wasn't really. I mean, I, I'm going to defend him, obviously. So um, you're going to have to bear that in mind. Okay. Um, he, he was a member of the. He was. A, he was to do. It was to do with the rectorship of the university. Uh, he, he did have a. He did was a card carrying Nazi, as most people were in those days. Um, not unimaginably, he wasn't a dedicated Nazi in any sense of the word. Uh, and it was there was a kind of a moment there when he when he took over the rectorship of the of the university where he thought he might be he might be able to do something with the university, um, which he wasn't able to do. He wasn't afforded to do, but. He, he, again, I, I, I'm defending him here, so bear that in mind. He fell into that trap that the other philosophers have, have had. Um, Plato did it himself, um, where you think that what that, what Heidegger thought was he could turn the Nazis into Heideggerians. That's basically what he thought, and it lasted for about ten months, and he wasn't able to. Obviously, he wasn't able to do it because he he just realised actually this is not going to change anything. This is more of the same. I mean, he realised that that was the case. And then if you look at, um, I've, in the summer, I, I was reading his Nietzsche lectures again. If you look at the Nietzsche lectures in there, he's very critical of the Nazis. And it was said, and it's, I can't remember who it was said by, but it was said that his Nietzsche lectures were in fact the only internal resistance, certainly intellectual resistance to the Nazis um, uh, w w when they were in power. But um, he certainly wasn't a Nazi in any, any sort of idealistic sense of the word. Um, but he did make. He, did, he said. He said he, he did make a misstep. Um, however, I have to say. I have to say this, and this is my opinion on these things, which might seem a little bit callous, but um, isn't meant to be. Uh, my interest in uh, a philosopher begins and ends with what they write. That's it. You know. Um, so when I read Being and Time, or when I read so the later, that, funnily enough, I'm really interested in Heidegger in the 1930s and beyond that. But when I'm reading Heidegger, I'm seeing a human being trying to save other human beings from, from themselves. That's what he's trying to do in his philosophy. So that's what interests me, you know. That's what interests me. But you do get other, you do get other people like Wittgenstein who lived a far more interesting life, but uh, his philosophy isn't, you know. So it depends what how you take it. But... Um, even if I couldn't live with that fact, even if I couldn't live with the fact that he joined the Nazis, the Nazi party anyway, it wouldn't turn me away from his philosophy because it's, his, it's what his philosophy that I'm thinking. But, but as I say, he did try, he did resist what they were saying. And of course, 
he did he did he did like lecture courses up like four lecture courses on Nietzsche and Nietzsche was their philosopher he was a Nazi philosopher but they he just showed how they completely misinterpreted him and he, and if you read the lecture courses he becomes increasingly uh, antagonistic to Nietzsche in those so if you read those I, I think you'd be able to see that he wasn't at least what some of his uh, greater detractors think of him but as I say it's a decision I'd look into, you know, it's a decision you'd have to look into, and I'm going to defend him because it's like my, it's my philosophy, so to speak. So, um, I would leave you to do that, but I would never let anything like that dissuade you from reading the works. Certainly not. There does seem to be something uh, incompatible between Heidegger's philosophy and Nazism, because I think I read something by Zizek where he said that Hitler did a revolution to prevent anything from changing. Like he didn't. Um, Hitler didn't really change anything. He was trying to preserve what was already there, kind of thing. Yeah. Well, that's it. I mean, I mean, and I've read, I probably read that same piece by Zizek when he he actually says that Heidegger got to a point, and he does. If, if you read his Black Mill books, which have been published in the last couple of years, three or four years, five years, if you read his Black Mill books, you can see right in the very early 1930s, he's stuck. He's stuck, and Zizek says that um, he actually saw the possibility of a breakthrough. In his thinking within the in, within what the Nazis were doing, but you know, not for long, because he's, because again, he just said, "Oh no, this is more of the same." You know, this is a world view, a, a God's on shelf, uh, and and he just quickly realised what that was. You know, he didn't stick with it or anything like that. Although I, he did seem to admire uh, Hitler as a as a leader for some reason, I have no idea. Why, why that might be. I, did, I do say seen. It just seems to me that it seems to think that there was something with him, not in the Nazi movement, but something with him. Because he did say it, I mean, in the, in the, in the 1930s, he talks about, as I say, about the work of art in that actual text. And I think in um, Introduction to Metaphysics, which was published the same, around the same time, oh, which was written around the same time, I should say, he sees different ways. Who, who deals, who's, who's able to found a new world, who's able to found a new history or something like that. And he sees it in the poets and he sees it in the thinkers, but he also sees it in the sort of the leaders. And then by the by the night by the, by before nineteen forty, that's dropped the leader bit. He just sees it in, in thinkers and he sees it in poets, the leader bit's completely gone. You know, so and again, he's a historical thinker trying to engage with the world around him. So, you know, un unpleasant things, un unpleasant thoughts are going to come up from out of the darkness. And then I guess it's how you respond to those. There's a similarity with Hegel there. Didn't Hegel idolise Napoleon and think that Napoleon was going to found a new history or something? Well, yeah, he this, saw, this saw, yeah. Um, yeah, to an extent, he saw the same kind of revolution going on. Well, he thought that it had arrived, the whole of history had arrived with what Napoleon was doing and what he was thinking. The two were completely compatible. But I don't know enough Hegel to, to know if that was his final conclusion or not. No, because I know, for example, Beethoven um, was going to dedicate one of his, I guess it was the Eroica Symphony, he was going to dedicate to Napoleon in about 1804, 1805, and then he took that back and called it the Eroica Symphony. You know, so I don't know where Hegel ended up um, in his thinking in that terms, but he certainly did see at one point at least that, you know, and I have to say, I, I was, you see, here we go now. If we could go down that hole, certainly, but I, I was a great admirer of Napoleon, and I am a great admirer of a lot of what Napoleon did. Obviously not wars, but um, he's an extraordinary, he's an extraordinary individual, because what he, what he was supposed to be exporting was reason, I guess. That's what he was supposed to be exporting, but it soon, you know, it quickly turned into, you know, putting family members in charge of places, so it deteriorated quickly. But there was certainly a sense, certainly at the beginning, that Napoleon is, Exporting this rational, this idea of rationality to the world and to the rest of Europe, and getting rid of the old regimes, you know, the old kings and queens, and and, and I guess um, religious ways of looking at the world, you know. But um, but it, it, these things don't usually end well. Um, so um, you said before that like uh, so. I mean, Hodlin's poetry hasn't really caught on very very strongly in in our times. And like you said before that, like, we need a God to save us. We need some kind of new great art. So do you see, like, any 
potential place where that art could arise, like the glimmer of hope anywhere? Well, um, to, only a God can save us. Um, just means something interceding from outside of humanity. <laughs> really, that's how I interpret it anyway. Do I see anything? What did, they, what did Nietzsche say 2,000 years and not a single new God? The desert will grow. Um, you want an honest answer? No. I don't see any way out. I don't see any way out at all. Um, I mean, the only... That doesn't mean nothing will happen. I don't believe in a determined universe, certainly not in a determined world. So, you know, things do happen. We have crises all the time. We just had a crisis. We're in a crisis. Um, we had a, a financial crisis in 2008. We're in a financial and, and obviously a, 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 a crisis both with a virus, both coming at the same time. Crises happen all the time. What is crisis? Ancient Greek word, judgment. It's a time for judgment time for making decisions so it's always possible that something that we weren't expecting turns up and and it's just a it's just the right moment where you know somebody or some people or some movement grasps hold of things and and makes change yeah. i'm not saying that that isn't possible um, i'm just saying that if you know if we're looking for science to come up with a with, the, with problems, with the, with the resolution to our problems with regards to climate change, which for me is the, the main problem. That's it. It's limiting us. Very short amount of time. If you're expecting science or anybody's expecting science to come up with it, then there's no point putting faith in science to do it because there's no guarantee. So we either we either have some kind of revolution as because something happens that people can gather around something and change things, or we don't. Um, but that's all it is. I mean, it's it's a possibility, yeah. but it's not something that I'm. I mean, I always say hope is for children. I really do. And what we need to do is we need to act. I think I think I'm wrong in that. I really do. But if 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 I want to be wrong in that as well, but if because I've got a young daughter, but we can't pin our faith in hope. We need something. We need even if it's preparing to do something when 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 an event happens. You know, just preparing to take to, to, to if, a, if a movement suddenly takes off, that we, we actually take off with it and, and and change things and put pressure on people because otherwise it's nothing's going to change. But, um, you know, philosophically, this is a difficult thing about doing philosophy now. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, two gentlemen, um, because philosophy takes a long time, it takes a long time for a philosophical thought to take to have an interaction if it's going to have an interaction. So the way out of our impending doom, I don't think, is uh, is something that's going to come from certainly any philosophical thinking. Or thinking. It's going to come from art. That, I guess that could that's a possibility, but I think it's going to come from it's going to come in the political arena. Mm. I think, as I said, you know, what is it? What does it? What does an artwork do? It gives us, in a sense, it gives us an, a very very powerful event that brings meaning into our existence. So if you think of it in those terms, as it brings something new, something happens, it brings something new for around which people can gather. That's what we've got to, that's, that's all that we can, we can, we can cling to. And, and as Heidegger would say, we have to prepare for something like this to happen. We have to prepare, we have to be ready for it. He talks about it in terms of being, but we have to be prepared for something to happen. And in the meantime, we need to be resisting in every possible way. So I'm not saying that if you don't hope if you give up hope, that means you don't do anything. You fight and you resist, and 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 prepare. But philosophy is not going to see us out of it. Yeah. So that makes you wonder why 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 write philosophy? But there is something kind of religious about that, like waiting for the second coming kind of thing. Yeah, that's how the ancient Christians lived, very temporarily, very meaningfully. Um, and that, that's what, yeah, I mean, there is. Nietzsche said that he's speaking that the next 200 years, the desert grows, if something going to occur, um, it, it might do. But you've got to be doing stuff in the meantime. You have to be doing stuff. And whether philosophy is one of those things, I recommend philosophy to everyone, by the way. I think if everybody did a, a three years unit on philosophy, the world wouldn't be anything like it. would be in that much, much nicer world. And it's kind of a philosophy is a process you undergo. 
which means that it, it, cha it, it changes the way you look at things, the way you look at the world. So I would never say, but I say, if you're looking to philosophy to, as they say, um, cup the soup, I don't think on this occasion it's going to be able to do that. Well, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, did you have any more questions, Aaron? Sorry, go on. Sorry. I so I do a song and dance just to make it cheery and cheery. <laughs> I'm juggling. I juggle the cat. I have to get up and let him in halfway through there. Well, it's been nice chatting to you two gentlemen. Good to chat to you too. Yeah. Um, I hope you have uh, a pleasant and peaceful Christmas, mm -hmm. at least, um, before you get back to work. How are you finding things? How are you finding the way we're doing things at the moment? Um, it's good. I mean, uh, I think that um, having longer units, well, I, I should sign up the podcast first, actually. Before we, so uh, uh, thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, I want to end it there.